This is Duke University. This is Office Hours at Duke University. Today, Professor Walter Sinnott Armstrong is taking your questions on how brain science is influencing legal cases. Sinnott Armstrong is the Chauncey Stillman Professor in Practical Ethics in the Department of Philosophy and the Keenan Institute for Ethics. He co-directs the MacArthur Law and Neuroscience Project and is a co-investigator at the Oxford Center for Neuroethics. A forthcoming book from Oxford University Press, which he co-edits, is Conscious Will and Responsibility. To ask Professor Walter Sinan Armstrong a question, send an email to live at duke.edu, tweet with the tag Duke Live, or post to the Duke University Facebook page. You can watch today's discussion again anytime on Duke On Demand. I'm James Todd from Duke's News Office, and I am here with Professor Walter Sinnott Armstrong. Professor Sinnott Armstrong, I want to dive in with an actual legal case, a Supreme Court case that is Graham versus Florida, and brain science appears in this case. So could you set this up for what's the case, and then how does neuroscience appear in it? You know, it was a very important case for people who work on neuro law because it was the first time that the Supreme Court actually mentioned neuroscience uh, in a majority uh, court opinion. Uh, Terrence Graham um, committed burglary when he was 17 of a, of a shop, and during that incident, the shop owner was injured quite severely. Uh, he was tried for that, convicted of burglary, but the judge in that first trial gave him probation. So he was released, <clears throat> but while he was on probation, he committed further crimes, uh, the worst of which was uh, breaking into a home uh, to steal things with a bunch of friends. Uh, and so probation was revoked. He was brought back for sentencing on the original burglary charge, and the judge gave him the maximum, which was life in prison. Uh, and in Florida, there was no parole, so that meant life without parole for an 18-year-old kid who had committed a couple of uh, burglaries. Uh, so uh, various legal groups jumped to his defense and argued that that was cruel and unusual punishment. And the court agreed on, for a number of reasons, but one of which was that uh, adolescents of that age uh, are not fully mature. Not only are their personalities still growing and changing, uh, but also their brains are still growing and changing. Uh, and so the neuroscience came in at that point uh, to uh, support the psychology, the observational evidence uh, that uh, they don't have the same capacities uh, as fully mature adults and because of that are not fully culpable. They're still culpable. It's not like anybody was arguing that he shouldn't go to prison at all, uh, but life without parole seems much too much. Uh, for someone at that stage of their life. So neuroscience there being used to make a distinction between the juvenile brain and the adult brain. Now another case that uh, brings up a slightly different issue that uh, you've taken a look at is this prosecution of Brian Dugan in Chicago uh, convicted for serial murder. How does brain science appear in that case? Right. That's a very different case because Brian Dugan uh, was a psychopath who committed horrible crimes, including uh, murders of, of young women uh, decades before uh, in the Chicago area, uh, DePage County. And uh, other people had been found guilty of those crimes and had spent a long time in prison, even though Dugan had over the years admitted that he committed those crimes. Uh, he didn't hide it. Uh, so. He was then found guilty of a number of different crimes, and the, and the neuroscience came in there in the sentencing phase of the trial. Okay. Uh, so, as with the, the Graham case, it was with regard to sentencing. But here is a question of capital punishment. Should he get capital punishment or not? And the defense wanted to introduce brain scans as a mitigating factor uh, to show that he should not get capital punishment, but should uh, go to prison instead. Uh, that case is actually currently under appeal because of some strange things that went on with the judge during the uh, uh, jury delivering its verdict. But <clears throat> the interesting thing is that neuroscience was introduced. The brain scans were, were in the evidence book at the sentencing phase. Now, this is just the start. It's still not being used in the, in the guilt phase of the trial, but uh, it's 
it's entering the courts and coming to a court near you soon. So in the Dugan case, when a defense attorney throws up his brain scan, I mean, what might they be pointing to in particular that says, see, here's a mitigating factor vis-a-vis -vis the death penalty? Well, there would be two different types of scans that were used there. There would be structural scans, which would show uh, smaller brain volumes and abnormalities in the paralimbic system uh, in the lower part of the brain. Uh, but there would also be functional scans uh, showing that while uh, Dugan was processing certain types of information, including, for example, emotional words, uh, that his brain patterns were uh, different from normal people. Uh, so that the emotions just didn't have the same effect on him. When you see a word like rape, most people go, oh, you mm -hmm. know, that's right. a real jarring word. Uh, but uh, he didn't show the same kind of reaction in his brain patterns in the functional scans. In, in talking about this concept of responsible and fully responsible for these crimes, we've got a question that's been emailed in, and, and it is, aren't the people who commit crimes still criminals and still responsible for their actions whether they are conscious of them or not? Well, I, I don't know about that. It seems to me that if you, uh, there's a certain element. Every criminal decision is made on the basis of the actus reus, the actual act that is performed, the mens rea, the mental state that goes along with it, and then there are further considerations of culpability relevant, for example, to the insanity defense or to youth. Uh, but let's look uh, at the actus reus. If I leave a restaurant and pick a coat up off the rack and take it out of the restaurant, and it turns out it's not my coat, I have not committed theft. Merely moving your body in a certain way is not enough to commit a crime. There has to be a mental state that accompanies it, okay? So if the brain scans can have us, help us to understand better the mental states uh, that people uh, were in when they committed these crimes, then uh, they can be helpful for whether they're guilty or not, even of the basic crime. So let's talk about these mental states, because I think people that watch TV dramas, I mean, they hear words like premeditation um, or pleading insanity. <clears throat> and so how might brain science be used as an evidence about a mental state? Well, there could be uh, a lot of different possibilities. Uh, with regard to psychopaths, just to go back to Dugan, uh, you could do brain scans, we're doing brain scans, to try to figure out whether they process moral judgments in the same way, uh, which would be evidence about whether or not they appreciate the wrongfulness of their conduct, uh, which is relevant at least according to the wording of the insanity defense in most uh, jurisdictions. Uh, you can also use brain scans to detect uh, I, when I say you can, I mean, people are trying to. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure that it works, but they're trying to use brain scans to detect lies uh, by witnesses, for example, uh, to detect pain uh, when people claim that they deserve disability benefits for the rest of their life because of a workplace injury and the insurance company thinks that they're faking it, uh, to detect consciousness in end-of-life cases, when people are in vegetative states but we're not sure what's really going on there. Terry uh, Schiavo, I think, is a big yeah, case in that. Yeah. is an example of that. Uh, and uh, to detect memories, somebody says, I've never seen this person before. How dare them accuse me of being a conspirator in this case? Well, we can see whether they remember the person's face uh, in a certain way that's distinctive of... Um, distinctive of having encountered them before. And, but again, when I say we can do that, you know, part of the problem is we can do that with a certain level of reliability. And at this point, we can do it in the lab. Okay. <laughs> so one of the problems is, does any of this stuff from the lab translate to the actual courtroom and the actual crime scene and the actual defendant? The other question is, look, it's gonna be reliable, but it's never gonna be perfect. So is it reliable enough? And that's where society and the legal system have to make a normative judgment. Uh, the scientists can do the best they can to get it as reliable as possible, but in the end, society has to make a decision about whether or not to allow this kind of evidence into the trials. And so can you talk about the steps that a, a lawyer would have to make, the argumentative steps to go from, okay, here's a picture of somebody's brain 
therefore it's a mitigating factor or therefore they didn't actually feel the pain. I mean, it seems that it, it's not immediately obvious, at least to a jury, to look at a picture of a brain and go, oh, I see he was lying. Um, I could do it with any either one of those. Uh, let's start lie detectors. I let's mean, start that, with, let's the, start with lie detectors. Uh, let's do the memory case because it's a type okay. of lie detection right. that's a little bit simpler. Uh, what you would do is you would show them 50 pictures uh, of people that they've never seen before, and then they see those pictures. And then you show them, uh, and then you put them in the scanner and you show them those 50 mixed in with another 50 and you figure out which brain patterns are distinctive of the 50 they've seen before versus the 50 they haven't seen before, mm -hmm. right? Then uh, you get uh, a pattern classifier that tells you the pattern of brain activity uh, working uh, when they recognize a picture, uh, a, recognize a face. And brain okay. activity, is, is that uh, electrical, a blood flow? What's it's it? electrical activity, but it's measured indirectly by blood flow using functional nuclear magnet, okay. magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, so um, then what you do is you take, uh, you know, say, 20 of the 50 they've seen before and a new 20 they haven't seen before, but this time throw in the face of the person they claim they've never met. You mm. know, he says, I did this crime with him. I've never seen this person before. Well, now we can check it. We can see whether the pattern that arises in the person's brain when they see a picture of that person is similar to or different from uh, sim the faces he's seen before versus the faces he hasn't seen before. Now, notice there's an obvious flaw here. Well, he might have seen this person in the courtroom or in the trial, so you can't always use it. You can only use it when they actually say, I still haven't ever seen this person. <laughs> right? Uh, so it's not always going to work. And when it works, it's not going to work perfectly. The question is, how can we use the science to make it work as well as possible in as many as possible cases? And then, will it be working well enough? You're watching Office Hours at Duke University. I'm here with Professor Walter Sinat Armstrong. He is the Chauncey Stillman Professor in Practical Ethics in the Department of Philosophy in the Keenan Institute for Ethics here at Duke. Uh, Professor Sina Armstrong, we were just talking about an example of a, a kind of lie detection, and I think the lie detector is something that uh, can capture the popular imagination. Yeah. It, do you see in the future the kind of metal dome coming down over the witness's head and a buzzer going off? And I mean, <laughs> is that uh, in the short term, Is that, or is that just sci-fi stuff? I don't see it coming down over the witness's head, certainly not in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do see the introduction of neuroscientific evidence when the, when the scans were done off-site uh, and then the results are brought in. I think it's very likely that's going to happen. Nita Farahani, a, a Duke grad in philosophy and in the law school, uh, has documented that over a five-year period uh, there were hundreds of cases that introduced neuroscience. And I don't remember the exact number, but I remember in California alone there were over 60 in this five-year period, uh, and the number was increasing. Uh, so, yes, uh, it's coming in. Uh, it's coming in in somewhat surprising ways, for example, with regard to competence rather than uh, culpability, more than culpability, but also with regard to culpability and mitigation of sentencing. Notice the two cases I mentioned were sentencing. It's coming in at that stage rather than the person's not guilty at all. It's more that they're, they're guilty, but they shouldn't be punished as much because of a certain finding. Uh, so it is coming, yes. And so uh, as neuroscience is being introduced, again, peering into the future, Right now, we're, we're all used to DNA evidence. I mean, it's now not only on TV, but in courtroom cases and in proving innocence. It's, it's common. People accept it. Do you see that kind of same acceptance growing for brain scans, for, for neuroscientific evidence? It's, it's possible. That would be pretty far in the future because, uh, because DNA evidence is extremely reliable at this point. And if people think that neuroscience has to live up to the standards of DNA, uh, then they're going to be very disappointed in the reliability they rate, rates that they see when they look at the actual experiments because neuroscience is nowhere near uh, that degree of reliability at present. Uh, there might be some circumstances where it gets very reliable, but not like the, the figures you hear from DNA. Uh, so 
it'll be like it in some ways, but, um, but different. And so in talking about Professor Farahani's work, uh, Duke alumna, uh, there's this emerging field of neuro law, and you've been involved in these conversations that talk about this intersection of, uh, of science and law. So what, um, what's this field about? Who's, what, are, what are the conversations, the topics that uh, people are writing about? Well, they're writing about the detection of mental states, like we just mentioned, mm -hmm. detection of lies, detection of pain, detection of memories, detection of consciousness. Uh, that's one area in which neuroscience is getting used currently. There are companies being started, four companies I know of with regard to lie detection, uh, and there's a rumor of a company uh, for pain detection uh, just getting off the ground. Uh, so that's one area, is detection of mental states. Another area is the criminal responsibility area that we mentioned with regard to juveniles and Dugan. Uh, you, defense mainly using uh, brain scans to, uh, to argue that they should receive less sentence or maybe even no sentence at all. Uh, and also general issues in that area where some neuro studies have led some people to claim that nobody's ever responsible for anything and then you get in the big philosophical issues about mm -hmm. free will and downward causation and so on uh, and that's part of the field as well but the third area that i think is worth mentioning uh, that's distinct from responsibility and also from uh, detection of mental states is prediction uh, there are some people who think that you can use neuroscience to predict various types of behaviors that are relevant to the law. So when someone has served a 10-year sentence in jail, uh, the question is, uh, should we let them out? Well, in some cases, you can be pretty sure they are going to commit another violent crime. Uh, with and how, proper how could you be sure? How could you predict the future? Well, you would predict the future, first of all, not solely on the basis of neuroscience. Neuroscience would not do it alone. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, neuroscience can be supporting evidence in a larger package of evidence. Uh, for example, there's a, a what's called the psychopathy checklist revised. And people who score over 30 on that uh, have, in many previous studies, 80% uh, recidivism rate for violent felonies within uh, five to seven years, depending on the study. Uh, but you can be pretty sure they're going to commit a violent crime. And that, by the way, is that's 80% that were caught. The other 20% might have done it too, they just never got caught. So these are people that fit this definition of uh, being a psychopath. Right. And then there's an 80% uh, recidivism exactly. given that category. And neuroscience comes in because one of the features of psychopaths is that they're pathological liars. Mm -hmm. So you can do these interviews, but some are going to slip through the cracks because they're good enough at fooling the interviewers. Uh, and so neuroscience comes in as supporting evidence that will increase the reliability of the evidence that these people are recidivists that have to be watched or controlled in some way. Maybe just watched more carefully during their, uh, you know, after getting out of prison. Mm -hmm. Maybe use GPS anklets on them so that you know where they are. Or maybe not let them out of prison because the U.S. Has, the US Supreme Court has held in Kansas versus Crane and Kansas versus Hendricks that sexual predators can be kept in jail for the rest of their life, in prison, for the rest of their lives uh, if uh, they're likely to commit uh, further offenses uh, and if they lack control over whether they do or not. Uh, so that's another possibility on the horizon. It scares a lot of people mm -hmm. uh, and yet it also has some promise for stopping these people from repeating their crimes. So that's always the tricky line you have to walk in this field. You, you, you know, want to be optimistic about the possibilities and get what you can out of neuroscience. But on the other hand, it's very dangerous stuff if it gets abused and misinterpreted. In talking about the limits of neuroscience, we've got a question that's come in by email. <laughs> And everyone watching is to, invited to ask Professor Sina Armstrong a question. You can do that by email. You can do it by Twitter or by Facebook. This question is, isn't bringing in neuroscience going against the legal tradition of trial by jury? So I guess there's a, that a jury is going to have limits in terms of the information they can take in. And uh, the case is always about a specific person. Um, so, yeah, what are some of those limits? 
Right. Some uh, uh, One Supreme Court Justice, Clarence Thomas, has said in a previous opinion that lie detection, no matter how reliable, even if it was 100% reliable, uh, still should not be allowed in because it usurps the traditional role of jurors. And some mm -hmm. people have that attitude. Uh, my view is, you know, there's some good traditions and there's some bad traditions. If there's a tradition that's leading to a lot of mistakes in our criminal courts, uh, so that people are found guilty when they shouldn't be found guilty, uh, then if we have a better way of doing it, then we ought to be careful before we overturn traditions because there's usually some wisdom in the tradition. Mm -hmm. um, but once it's been tested, if it works better and leads to fewer mistakes in the criminal justice system, then why not? Uh, it's my question. The mere fact that it's tradition is not good enough. Uh, what we want is the most reliable, most accurate criminal decisions we can get. And if science helps us make those decisions more accurate, uh, then uh, it's, it's a useful tool. And in talking about limits, what would be some wrong ways of using neuroscience, particularly when you're, you're dealing with a, a jury that's, you know, it's a lay group and doesn't have expertise, they're not scientists, and maybe you've seen examples already of how neuroscience has been misused in the courtroom, or you could imagine some. Well, sure. Uh, for example, uh, if someone has frontal lobe damage, uh, then they might say, I should be let off uh, or I should receive a lesser sentence because I have frontal lobe damage and therefore I don't control my behavior. And then they say, here's a study for you. you know, frontal lobe damage produced uh, in Vietnam vets in a study by Jordan Grafman uh, led to a uh, five-fold increase in aggressive violence mm -hmm. uh, during, uh, I think it was a two-year study, if I remember correctly. I might be wrong there. Uh, but it was a five-fold increase uh, in violence. And so this person says, I've got this thing that produces a five-fold increase in violence, therefore I mitigate it. Wait a minute, let's look at that study carefully. It matters a lot where the, uh, where the um, lesion is in the frontal lobes. Frontal lobes are like Asia. They're a big place, I mean, a giant area of the brain, uh, first of all. But second of all, even in Jordan Grafman's study, five-fold increase meant from 3% to 15%. There's still 85% that didn't. So the mere fact that you've got frontal lobe damage is just not good enough to say that your sentence ought to be mitigated. Uh, and yet, if you come in with this picture of the person's brain and there's this black area that's absolutely clear and it's a structural scan that's a very reliable form of scanning of the brain, uh, then it might be convincing to jurors. Uh, in one study by Gurley and Marcus, uh, when you had testimony about brain injury plus pictures of brain scans, it led from instead of 11% of the defendants being found guilty, it went all the way up to 42%. So almost four times as many people are being found not guilty by reason of insanity in that particular study, uh, simply because they've seen this brain scan. But the brain scan doesn't really show you anything out of the context of all the psychological information. And without knowing exactly where in the frontal lobes it is, it really has to be done very carefully. And when it's done badly, it can lead to bad results. Uh, yeah, I mean, you have the, the CSI effect. I mean, people now uh, have seen CSI, and so they think, well, where's the <coughs> DNA evidence? And so you're talking about a scenario where a juror, a hypothetical juror, says, I, I didn't necessarily understand that brain science, but they're bringing that kind of evidence, so therefore it, they must have a good case, and that's, uh, that's a misuse. That's absolutely a misuse. You know, people don't trust jurors, and so we wanted to find out whether jurors really are gonna get swayed. You know, neuroscientists, don't get me wrong, some of my best friends are neuroscientists, but they think they're gonna walk into the courtroom and they're gonna go, I'm a neuroscientist and I've got this degree and I've got all these publications and you, the jurors, are gonna get wowed and believe what I say. Well, it doesn't actually work that way. Okay. Uh, when, when we did a study, and we, this is Michael Sachs uh, out at uh, Arizona State uh, Law School, uh, did a study, I just helped design it, he ran it. Uh, and did most of the design as well. I don't want to take credit when it's really his work. Um, it was in the, the MacArthur Law and Neuroscience Project that I co-directed. Um, so we found that, in fact, brain images didn't have much effect at all. So jurors are shrewder than 
you might think. They come out of the, and there, there are all these anecdotes of jurors coming out of the courtroom. They were trying to pull the wool over my eyes. Those fancy scientists with their credentials. You know. But notice, that's bad too, right? There's a lot of misunderstanding and mistrust. Mm -hmm. um, it might be that the jurors trust the scientists too much. It might be that they trust them too little. I'd kind of like them to trust them the right amount. <laughs> uh, but that, of course, requires a lot of scientific training and careful explanation and public understanding of neuroscience. You know, so part of this field is interested in just getting the word out about neuroscience so that people will understand it better, both its, its benefits and its dangers. Very good. You're watching Office Hours at Duke University. I'm speaking here with Professor Walter Sinat Armstrong. He is the co-editor of a forthcoming Oxford University Press book, Conscious Will and Responsibility. We've got some questions coming in. Uh, one comes by email from Stuart, and he asks, how might our neuroscience-based understanding of behaviors such as drug addiction lead to changes in sentencing <laughs> or treatment guidelines? Could we hope that this might lead to fewer incarcerations? Uh, you can always hope, Stuart. That's a good question. Uh, addiction is a big problem in our country. Uh, and uh, we mentioned youth and psychopathy, but addiction uh, is right up there uh, with uh, its connection to crime and its importance. Uh, whether the neuroscience is actually go going to change the law is anybody's guess. Uh, I uh, think it's very likely. I'm hopeful because I think it should change the law. We're incarcerating people who would be much better off uh, if treated in an appropriate treatment program, and a lot of states are beginning to see that with alternative uh, legal uh, systems, alternative courts, drug courts, which enforce treatment plans rather than prison, uh, and that keeps the families together, that helps the drug addict, and it, and it reduces the recidivism rate as well. Uh, so I think there's a lot of hope there, and I think the neuroscience of drug addiction, which is, is much more advanced, for example, than the neuroscience of psychopathy, um, is, is helping to drive that. Because people see that, that people's brains have actually been changed by, by these drugs, uh, and that leads them to think that maybe they don't have as much control as they used to have. That's a very tricky inference whether the fact that their brains have changed means they don't have as much control. Uh, but uh, it does seem to lead people to draw that conclusion, uh, and then they tend to be more supportive of alternatives to prison. Okay, like we'll, we'll keep picking up this issue of responsibility and, and yes. degrees. We've got an email question here from Nazanin, who asks, in regards to performing brain scans on suspects, are there any potential ethical issues concerning breach of privacy Will there be warrants issued for these scans? So privacy, I mean, it comes up with DNA, with brain scans, I imagine, too. A very good question. And the person I mentioned before, Nita Farahani, has a wonderful paper on this. Uh, I'm not sure if it's out yet, but uh, you can look her up at Vanderbilt and check her website. I'm sure it's up there. Uh, the privacy issues are quite interesting because uh, there, uh, there are several uh, amendments to the Constitution that are relevant. The self-incrimination clause, you can't be required to... Uh, incriminate yourself. So if the brain scan is seen as a form of speaking, it sounds like you're being forced to incriminate yourself. But if the brain scan is instead just looking for a trace of a uh, memory of the person, as in what the case I mentioned before, then it, it's not speaking. You're just looking at the pictures. You're not forced to say anything. So then it looks less like self-incrimination. But maybe it looks like unreasonable search and seizure. Uh, well, unreasonable search and seizure, you're not taking a blood sample for the person. That might not be allowed, a blood sample without their, uh, without their consent. This is non-invasive. You, you just have to sit in the tube in the middle of the magnet, uh, so we're not actually taking your blood. So it's a very interesting issue in constitutional law, whether this violates traditional rights to privacy or not, because it kind of falls in between you know, taking a blood sample and uh, making the person confess, it's not really quite the same as either of those, and it'll be fascinating to see uh, what the court decides on that issue. And what about an analogy with fingerprinting? I mean, that's non-invasive, and we don't, you know, book them and fingerprint them. I mean, exactly. could it be a book them and scan them? Exactly. If it's more, and, and actually, one of the first companies on lie detection 
was very smart. They call themselves brain fingerprinting because they want to say what we're doing is like fingerprinting, and that's why you want to allow it in the courtroom. And neural marketing will be a different uh, yeah. topic. Okay. <laughs> Nazanin actually came back with uh, another question here. Do you think we should scan everyone and declare them adults if they have a certain level of brain development instead of making everyone an adult at 18? I guess this takes us full circle to the Graham case and yeah. juvenile versus adult. Another great question. I, you, you got a great audience. Uh, the answer is no. And the reason is that the rate of false positives in all of these scans is going to be quite high. Uh, they're good, but they're imperfect. And when you start talking about uh, the general population and using it for a screening device, you're going to be making too many mistakes. And so, so false positives, ex you know, explain that. What would be yeah. the danger with false positives of sort of kind of preemptive right. evidence? So she was asking about age uh, and immaturity, but let me switch just because it's simpler mm -hmm. uh, back to the psychopathy. Uh, I can do a brain scan now and uh, look at the structure of your brain and use that as a predictive tool to, uh, for your psychopathy score. And if you're over 30, that means there's an 80% chance of recidivism in the next five years. That's pretty scary. And the reason it's scary is because it's got a pretty high false positive rate and high false negative rate. It's impressive that we can do what we can, but it's still got a pretty high rate. Psychopathy is only about a half to 1% of the population. Well, if you have even a 5% false positive rate, that means you're going to have an awful lot of people being falsely diagnosed as psychopaths uh, just in order to catch a very small number who actually are psychopaths. That's not a good policy for the legal system. So screening, I think, is probably not a good thing to do. There are also, of course, cost issues. I mean, the cost of scanning everybody in this country would you know, be tremendous. Uh, what we're really talking about here more, uh, the only thing that's really practical is taking people after they've committed crimes and then try, and then using scans on them. You're talking about false positives and um, before we were comparing <coughs> neuroscience with the other big science in law the, of DNA, but you're also bringing up uh, fingerprinting other sciences or, or semi-sciences that get used in the courtroom, I mean, blood sp splattering, and uh, where, does, where does neuroscience fit now and maybe in the future on the reliability scale for evidence that's introduced? Well, uh, it's certainly better than boot prints and you know, handwriting analysis, <clears throat> at least for some of the things that neuroscience is used for. Uh, but it's definitely not as good as DNA. So it's somewhere in the middle. And where in the middle depends on which particular use we're talking about. Uh, if we're talking about giving a diagnosis of psychopathy, that's one thing. Detecting lies is another thing. Detecting consciousness at the end of life, yet another thing. Uh, and so different levels of reliability for different uses. Uh, so it's hard to answer the question more specifically, uh, except to say they're all getting better. Good. You know, in the future, you know, five, ten years down the line, it's going to be much better. You look back, the first... Uh, brain scans, first fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging scans, were less than 20 years ago. Uh, first studies published using fMRI, less than 20 years ago. It's amazing how far this science has come in 20 years. You project 20 years in the future, uh, I wouldn't even, you know, I wouldn't even uh, try to guess uh, what the reliability figures are going to be and what the uses are going to be. You mentioned consciousness at the end of life, and I think if we talk about the neuroscience and the law, we have to talk about the Terry Schiavo case yeah. and related. So how, how does, what does brain science have to say about persistent vegetative state? That's the term that we hear in the news. Right. One of the questions is whether it's persistent. Another question is whether it's vegetative. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a recent study in the New England Journal of Medicine, this is I think last May, uh, where uh, Stephen Laurie's group uh, scanned uh, 52 patients uh, who were supposedly in minimally conscious states or, or vegetative states uh, and that tried to detect consciousness uh, in those states. And they found one patient, I'll just tell you about one of them because okay. you don't want to hear about all 52, <laughs> but uh, one of them they found, was, it was just truly amazing. They, they said, okay, I mean, this person is lying there with motionless, no indication of any reaction on the outside to the environment. And they said, 
Imagine that you're standing on a tennis court and now move your arm as if you're hitting a tennis ball back to a professional during a lesson who's hitting it right to you. So you don't have to move your legs, just move your arm. Imagine, so they can't do it, but imagine. They can't this. do anything. They're okay. lying there motionless on the table. Just imagine it. Uh, and they detected activity in the motor strip. And was it detected? Which is the area of the brain that would have been used to actually move their arm to play tennis. And does this person have electrodes on them? Are they in a... Uh, They're in a uh, fMRI. fMRI. They're in a large donut-shaped magnet. Okay. Okay. Uh, then they said, now imagine walking through your home. You go from room to room, and, uh, and uh, they found activity in the spatial location area, which is a very distinct part of the brain. And on a control sample, they got 100% accuracy as to what the person was, you know, th th these areas were clearly associated with that type of, uh, of thinking. So they said, we got we to gotta check this out. So they said to this person who, again, is just lying still. And by the way, this is a 22-year-old who'd been in a vegetative state for five years from a traumatic brain injury. Uh, they said, uh, was your father named Robert? I forget the actual names, but mm -hmm. was your father named Robert? Mm -hmm. Uh, if the answer is yes, think about playing tennis. If the answer is no, think about walking through your home. And they saw the activity in the tennis area. And sure enough, his name was Robert. Hmm. They said, was your father's name John? And they said, if the answer is yes, think about tennis. If the answer is no, think about walking through your house. And they saw the area in the spatial. And he answered five questions in a row correctly, just by manipulating his brain activity by either thinking about tennis or walking through the house. On the sixth question, there was no response and they think he probably went to sleep because the suspicion is, especially after five years in a state like that, you're gonna come and go uh, with consciousness. So this type of study is obviously fascinating. It has big implications for what we should do uh, with patients who are in this kind of circumstance. But I wanna say, don't jump to conclusions. One of the big dangers in neuroscience is people go, oh, that's great, you know, isn't it cool? I mean, it really is cool. Mm -hmm. But uh, you don't want to jump to conclusions or practical actions too quickly. For example, this is not Terry Schiavo. Terry Schiavo, it was a brain disease 19 years before, and her, almost her entire brain had atrophied and the cells were dead. I mean, there's just no chance that there was consciousness in that case, unlike this case. Right? So you really need careful neuroscientists, or in this case, neurologists, to come in and tell you, is this brain activity really indicative of this or not? And one of the problems is that it's very technical stuff. Mm -hmm. Neuroscience is not easy. Mm -hmm. And then you pull people off the street and say, I want you to be a juror, <laughs> right? And you don't know neuroscience from, from neurology. You, can't, you don't know the difference. And you're, you have to sit there for eight hours listening to arguments in the courtroom. Uh, and most people are not used to listening to arguments more than a couple of minutes at a time. Maybe an hour if they listen to the presidential debates. But most people by the end of the presidential debates are tired. That's a lot of argument. Well, you have to do that eight times in a row when you're a juror. Listen mm -hmm. to people do it. And then remember it later. So there's a lot of problems with is the jury really going to understand this kind of information? Or, e or even the judge, by the way. Judges, you know, a lot of judges were English majors or whatever. They don't know science. Uh, and, so, and yet they're the ones that are going to have to decide uh, as well. Mm -hmm. we, we've got a question that's coming along sure. those lines of neuroscience <laughs> and, and a lay understanding. Everyone watching can ask Professor Sinat Armstrong a question. You can do that by email. You can do it by Twitter or you can do it by Facebook. This question comes in by email from Christine who asks, can scans pick up on emotional states like guilt? So I guess that's a twist on the lie detector, but is someone feeling guilty about what they have done? Yeah. Uh, good question. Emotional states, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, with limited reliability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, guilt is a very complex emotion. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Anger is much easier. Disgust, much easier. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some basic emotions that neuroscientists have been studying and they have associated with certain networks in the brain. It's usually not so simple that, you know, well, you know, anger is in the amygdala and, and uh, disgust is in the insula. It's not 
that simple. It's mm -hmm. going to be a network. Uh, but they can pick up on some basic emotions and, and see not only whether the person's feeling it, but in some cases, in some studies, some indication that they can detect how much anger they're feeling or how much disgust they're feeling. Guilt, though, guilt's very complex. complex. I, wish, I wish the caller would even tell me exactly what it is. That would be nice to know. We've got another question coming in from uh, Tara or Tara. And switching gears a little bit about your own career and interest, I mean, you're a philosopher, and here we've been talking about law for, uh, for a long time. And she asked, how did you start studying this? Were you always interested in brain science? Um, I think I was always interested in brain science. Uh, mm -hmm. When I was in college, uh, you know, the psychologists watched rats running through mazes or they, you know, put lesions into rats and, and did electrode studies. It was only in the, 90, in the later 90s and, and the noughties, the first decade of the, of the uh, second millennium uh, of, the, of, the, of the 21st century, that, um, that we were able to do the high-level cognitive type work uh, that we're doing now. What got me interested in this was, was really a student. I was teaching my introductory ethics course as I always did, and I say, here's Kant, and here's utilitarianism, and here's the doctrine of double effect, and Aquinas, and Aristotle, and you're teaching the classic theories. And this one student who, uh, I always say this, and, and she's not even embarrassed by it, because she was really obnoxious. She would always raise her hand and say, okay, so I have that intuition too, and so do you, but why do we have that intuition? Like, what's behind our moral reaction to that case. And I realized I didn't, answer, I didn't have an, a good answer to that question. Uh, and so Jana Scheichborg is her name, mm -hmm. uh, still a dear friend. And uh, she pushed me towards answering those questions. And we did, uh, she did a thesis on it at Dartmouth. This is back when I was at Dartmouth. And we ended up publishing parts of, of the thesis uh, in a neuroscience study of the background of these intuitions that drive people. So it was really a student. Uh, then I also have to give credit to uh, other faculty members. You know, neuroscientists, you come in with a good idea, and they'll usually listen to you. They're really receptive. They say, that's interesting. Maybe we should do an experiment on that. Mm -hmm. And at Dartmouth, there were a couple of people, Mike Gazanica and, uh, and Scott Grafton, who, who basically took me under their wings and, and said, you know, here's some funding. We'll help you design it. We'll help you analyze it and write it up and talk to you about it. And they were great, very supportive. Uh, so, uh, you know, with the student stimulating you and the neuroscientists helping you, it's, it's hard not to be fascinated by this stuff. So, yeah, with our remaining time here, you are a philosopher. Uh, you're talking about philosophical schools of thought. Some of that must come to bear in terms of how law and neuroscience interact. I mean, you're talking about issues of free will and responsibility and justice. Uh, do you have a, a philosophical school that you subscribe to, or are there competing schools? Uh, I do have a school that I subscribe to, but I'm not sure that uh, the audience wants me to explain it in great detail. I'm a contrastivist, uh, but only professionals even know what that means, and only about 10 of us actually subscribe to it. So, um, But the basic... Uh, role for philosophy in, uh, in these issues is to try to get the concepts clear. Mm -hmm. And that's where contrastivism actually helps. Mm -hmm. uh, take freedom, for example. Uh, is your country free? Uh, are those mints free? Uh, am I free uh, to act as I wish? And the student who comes to the office and says, you know, Professor Senator Armstrong, are you free right now? Uh, <laughs> You want to understand the concept of freedom. It's mm -hmm. not just ambiguous, by the way. Mm -hmm. It's not just like, you know, pig pen and writing pen. Uh, it's not ambiguous. There's actually a contrastivist analysis to show how they're all, actu they're all getting at a central core structure of the concept. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that have to do with neuroscience? The answer is, if we're really going to use neuroscience to understand freedom and responsibility, we have to get clear about what we're trying to understand. Mm -hmm. And the neuroscientists are great at getting empirical data. What the philosophers add is conceptual analysis to get really clear about what the question is uh, mm -hmm. and what we're trying to find out with this scientific research. And so how does that, you're co-editing this uh, book from Oxford University Press, Conscious Will and Responsibility, right. some highlights from there that, that <clears throat> touch on this? Well, that was, uh, 
triggered by the fact that Benjamin Libet died in 2007. So we had a little conference. He, is, who is he? he was a, a great neuroscientist mm -hmm. who studied a simple motor actions like flexing your wrist, mm -hmm. just moving your wrist, in some mm -hmm. cases just pressing a button. Uh, and he got some very surprising results. He actually found that the brain activity of a certain sort, called a readiness potential, or RP, started about a third of a second before you were conscious of choosing to move your wrist. You could choose to move your wrist at any time you wanted. And you could record when you became conscious of choosing to move your wrist, but it looked like the brain activity was happening that, that led to your wrist moving was happening before that, which made it look like consciousness wasn't the cause of your wrist starting to move, mm -hmm. he said. And of course, there's a big debate about that, and the volume has you know, people going, no, you can't say that, yes, you can say that, and follow-up experiments of various sorts using you know, everything from you know, hypnosis to, uh, to bells and TMS, deadening certain brain cells at the time. So it's, a, it's an interesting volume because it starts with these very simple experiments of just you know, what's happening when you move your wrist and draws big philosophical implications and legal implications as well. Mm. Although many of the people in the volume are very skeptical about those potential implications. Uh, there are others in the volume who say, you know, actually uh, you can draw some big lessons from little experiments. Okay. As, as Pretty deep territory there. Yeah. We got another question. I want to get this in before okay. we sign off here. Uh, an email from Mark. Could Dr. Armstrong address the ethical problem of what should be done pragmatically with people who may have conscious activity but are unlikely to come out of such comatose conditions? Also, the procedures for detaching such conscious states, detecting such conscious states require highly specialized training that is expensive and not covered by insurance. So Back to the, I guess, persistent vegetative state, okay. comatose sure. the condition. Uh, I think that not covered by insurance is probably not going to be much of a problem because mm -hmm. if the insurance company is paying for the hospitalization of this person, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, they uh, surely want to find out whether this person wants to remain on life support mm -hmm. or not. It's very possible. I mean, I'm just projecting my mm -hmm. own situation. If I were in this kind of situation, I'm not sure whether I would want to you know, continue treatment or not. If we think patients have uh, the right to decide whether or not to be treated and to treat them without permission uh, is a violation of their rights of privacy, then uh, a, a patient in that situation could be asked, do you want to be kept alive or not? Mm -hmm. And you might have to ask it several times to make sure that you've got the answer straight. You want to make sure that you're not just misreading the data. You're talking the about data. detecting it through brain yeah. activity. You say, if you want to stay alive, think of playing tennis. If you don't want to stay alive, think of walking through your house. And if you do that five times and get a consistent signal and a consistent answer over a period of time, then uh, they're in effect telling you, withdraw treatment. I do not give you permission to treat me. Uh, and then to treat them might be a violation of their rights. Uh, so it could have big implications, but you gotta be careful because as the, as the caller said, um, it takes training, uh, the stuff is imperfect at this point, uh, but I can imagine a day when, uh, not too far off in that case actually, mm -hmm. uh, when uh, we could take those patients and ask them what they would like. Mm -hmm. uh, which it seems to me is what medicine ought to be doing, not telling people what ought to happen to them, mm -hmm. but asking them what they want. Good. Professor Sinat Armstrong, we've covered a lot of territory here. And uh, let's wrap up. You've got a conference coming up in the spring. Yes. So uh, we'll give a shout out to uh, what, if people might be interested, to what should they look forward yeah, to? Yeah, it's going to be very exciting. I'm, I'm organizing it with Scott Hutel in, in the uh, Cognitive, Center for Cognitive Neuroscience here, and the yeah, Duke Institute for Brain Science is, is funding uh, the large portion of it, and the Keenan Institute for Ethics as well. It's mm -hmm. about the implications of neuroscience uh, and psychology, but mainly neuroscience for free will and responsibility. So we'll have people coming from all over the country to. Um, I think there are five philosophers and seven neuroscientists. There are some people who do animal work. There are people who do uh, 
EEG work or electroencephalograph work, as well as fMRI studies. So we have a variety of different methodologies, a variety of different subject populations. There's some people talking about addiction for the caller who asked about addiction. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and the big question is, can neuroscience help us address these traditional philosophical puzzles uh, that people have been wondering about for so long and that, you know, that really do have practical importance in terms of the legal system. Professor Sinat Armstrong, thank you for holding your office hours online today. Thanks. Professor Walter Sinat Armstrong is the Chauncey Stillman Professor in Practical Ethics in the Department of Philosophy and Keenan Institute for Ethics here at Duke. He also co-directs the MacArthur Law and Neuroscience Project he is co-editor of the forthcoming Oxford University Press book, Conscious Will and Responsibility. I'm James Todd from Duke's News Office. You've been watching Office Hours at Duke University. A recording of this conversation and many other Duke videos will be available on the Duke On Demand website. Watch Duke. On Demand. Ondemand.duke.edu. This week on Duke On Demand, a Duke Athletics video report takes a look back at the victories and lessons from last year's championship season. Men's basketball, obviously, phenomenal run. Uh, men's lacrosse, phenomenal outcome. When I think of those epic championship games, I'll take them to the grave. But we were so close to having a phenomenal year across, again, 26 sports, campus, rec, intramurals, and, uh, and the physical education program. And we didn't really have a phenomenal year. We had a really good year, but we have a lot ahead of us because we have a chance to have a phenomenal year. Also this week, Enhancing My Medical Education Through Photography is a talk at the Center for Documentary Studies by Duke pediatrician and photographer John Moses. And Defense Secretary Robert Gates gives an address on campus about the makeup of the military. ondemand.duke.edu